بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله إن الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد Continuing with our journey through Islamic manners and good manners and characteristics, as well as etiquettes, we're talking today about Islamic manners that pertain to speech, that pertain to the tongue. And we remind ourselves that one of the reasons that we're studying this is to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through improving our character. So whatever we hear, we need to not be from those who think about, actually I know somebody who falls into this category or falls into this mistake, rather we should first think about ourselves. Does it apply to me? Can I improve in this particular area of good manners and characteristics? And more than often the answer will be yes, of course I can. So that's what we're doing it for, is to improve ourselves so that we can live a better life and be more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. طيب, today is Islamic manners that pertain to speech. As we said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in Surah Al-Qaf, he mentions وَمَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ and no statement, nothing comes out of the mouth of a human being except that therein there is an angel waiting, a scribe waiting to write it down. So everything that comes from our mouths is written down and recorded and we're going to be asked about it on the Day of Judgment. SubhanAllah. Abdullah ibn Mas'udin radiallahu anhu, the great companion, he said in the hadith collection, Sahih at targhib this is an athar, meaning it's a statement of a companion, not a statement of the Prophet ﷺ, which would be a hadith. So in this athar, Abdullah bin Mas'udin radiallahu anhu, he said, وَالَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ غَيْرُ He said, I swear by Allah, by whom there is no other Lord besides He. مَا عَلَى الظَّهْرِ الْأَرْضِ شَيْءٌ أَحْوَجُ إِلَى طُولِ السِّجْنِ مِنَ الْهِسَانِ There is nothing upon the earth that is deserving of being imprisoned for a long time more than the tongue. Right? The tongue it never tires, it never stops, it can move continually. It can go from topic to topic, even when it's not asked to speak about a particular topic, it will speak. It can bring you good, but more than often, it can bring you that which is detrimental to you in this life and the hereafter. So the tongue is something that needs to be observed, and a person needs to think deeply about how they use their tongue. And of course, that comes through studying and reflecting and listening to the speech of the righteous people that guide us to how we should use our tongues. So preserving the tongue and using it is something which is imperative because falsehood, slander, backbiting and lewd speech and all kinds of abuse, the Muslim, we have to protect ourselves from this. As in the hadith we mention quite often, المسلمون من سلم المسلمون من لسانه ويده that the Muslim is the one who saves others from the harm of his own speech or her own speech and their hands, right? So the objective is that we have to ensure that we don't harm anybody with our speech because it could be backbiting that we fall into, it could be lying, it could be lewd speech, it could be cheating and so many other things which the Prophet ﷺ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited us, prohibited us from doing, we find that we easily fall into, into this day and age. And we need to remember often that this tongue it could be just one word that brings us the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore gives us the hereafter or it could be one word that brings forth the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not only ruins our life in this world but also in the hereafter so we have to be so careful as to what and where our tongue is taking us what are we using our tongues for and what do we find ourselves busy with regarding our tongues the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said in the hadith in bukhari inna al-abd la yatakallamu bi kalimatin min ridwanillah la yulqi laha bal Allahu biha darajat that verily a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks a word and hasn't thought much about this word but due to that word pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah raises that person high up in paradise due to that one word and on the converse on the opposite side wa inna al-abd la yatakallamu bi kalimatin min sakhtillah la yulqi laha bal yahwi biha fi jahannam that a person can speak a word not thinking much about it However, this word is from that which angers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and due to that word, it takes the person deep into the hellfire. May Allah protect us. In Tirmidhi, 
Mu'ad ibn Jabir radiyallahu anhu came to the Prophet sallallahu asking him to guide him to good deeds that will enter him into Jannah. So Mu'ad asked about deeds that will enter him into Jannah. The Prophet sallallahu told him deeds pertaining to the pillars of Islam, told him other very important deeds. And then he said to him, Ala ukhbiruka bi malaki dhalika kullihi. O oh, Mu'ad, should I not tell you about that which can cover and complete all of those good deeds that I've mentioned to you previously, meaning the pillars of Islam and other righteous deeds that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith. He said, should I not tell you of that which can complete and make firm all of these good deeds, meaning it's something which is very important. Qutubala ya Rasulullah, Mu'ad said, of course, O Messenger of Allah, this is what I want to know. Ya Nabi Allah, fa'akhada bi lisanihi. So the Prophet ﷺ took hold of his tongue and he said, kuffa anka hadha, kuffa alayka hadha. Control this from being used too often. Control this from harming you. فَقُلْتُ يَا نَبِيَ اللَّهِ So Mu'ad, he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, إِنَّ لَمُؤَاخِذُونَ بِمَا نَتَكَلَّمُ بِهِ Are we going to be taken to account for what we speak, for the words that we say? Will we be held to account for this? So the Prophet ﷺ said, فَكُلَتْكَ أُمُّكَ The Prophet ﷺ gave a statement of being surprised at how could Mu'ad not know this? He said, may your mother be bereaved of you. And it's not a literal dua, meaning may your mother lose you. It's a statement that Arabs of old used to use, meaning how strange a statement for you to make. Like how dumb a statement you can make. So he said, وَهَلْ يَكُبُّ النَّاسِ فِي النَّارِ عَلَى وُجُوهِهِمْ أَوْ عَلَى مَنَاخِرِهِمْ إِلَّا هَصَائِدُ أَلْسِنَتِهِمْ And is it not the case, O oh Mu'ad, that people are thrown into the hellfire on their faces or upon their noses based upon what their tongues gather for them? So in this part of the narration, the Prophet ﷺ is telling Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, if you truly want to be somebody who amasses a lot of good deeds and can control and protect those good deeds, then you have to take care of your tongue. And you have to know that it's due to this tongue that people are thrown into the hellfire. Because as we mentioned before, it just goes on non-stop talking and never gets tired. The Prophet ﷺ guaranteed Jannah for the one who is able to think logically and carefully and ponder before they speak. Why? Because in the hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَن يَضْمَن لِي مَا بَيْنَ لَحْيَيْهِ وَمَا بَيْنَ رِجْلَيْهِ أَضْمِن لَهُ الْجَنَّةِ In Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever guarantees for me that which is between their two jaws and between their two legs, then I guarantee for them Jannah. Why did the Prophet ﷺ mention these two limbs? Meaning the tongue and that which is between the legs, the private parts. Because these are things which are easily excitable okay the excitement pertaining to your private parts and the lust and desires that comes from that and with regards to your tongue being used in every situation whether it's a good situation or a bad situation it's very easy these limbs are easy excitable and easily uh, you know get carried away so it's important to control them and the one that can control them is guaranteed Jannah by the Prophet ﷺ because it means that the one who controls them is often thinking about the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and often worried about how these limbs are going to be used. Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu, the great companion in hadith collected by Imam Ahmad, he said that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا أَصْبَحَ ابْنُ عَادَمْ فَإِنَّ أَعْضَاءَهُ تُكَفِّرُ لِنِسَانِ تُكَفِّرُ لِنِسَانِ تَقُولُ If the son of Adam gets up, or the daughter of Adam gets up in the morning, the tongue, the rest of the body says to the tongue, beware of Allah regarding us, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pertaining to us. Fear Allah pertaining to us, O tongue, because verily if you are upright and you are correct, then we are going to be upright and correct. And if you go crooked and astray, then we are going to go crooked and astray. Meaning that the tongue, it doesn't just affect the tongue, right? It affects the whole body. That which you say often can affect your heart, can affect your mind, can affect the actions that you do. Okay? So that, when you start to speak about good a lot, it will lead you to good. But when you speak about evil a lot, it can lead you to evil. So we have to be very careful as to what we talk about. So the Prophet ﷺ, knowing how important this topic is about the tongue, he guided us to something that we should be doing with our tongue often. Listen to this hadith in Bukhari. Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir fala yu'di jarahu. Whoever believes in Allah and in the last day, then that person should not harm their neighbor. Wa man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir 
فَلْيُكْرِمْ ضَيْفَهُ And whoever believes in Allah and in the hereafter, then let them be good to their guests. And this is the important part. وَمَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَصْمُتْ And whoever believes in Allah and in the hereafter, then let that person speak good or remain silent. Being silent, right, in today's day and age, people look upon it as being a weird thing, very strange. Why doesn't this person talk much? Why is this person not very social? You know, is this person an introvert? All of these negative descriptions. But rather, being silent in Islam is a very noble characteristic. Because as we've established now, the tongue can bring about much harm for us, right? And it can also bring about much good, as we're going to mention. But before we speak, we have to be very cognizant of what we're going to say. We have to think, is this going to bring about benefit for me? Then I should go ahead and speak. If it's going to be harm or if it's too much just playful speech, I should leave it alone because I could be taken to account for it on the Day of Judgment. So it's a noble thing to be silent and not to speak unless there is a benefit in doing so. And this also shows that you are comfortable with who you are as a person. Because generally people who are comfortable in their own shells, in their own selves, they don't have to talk much, right? Most people are talking today in today's society because they want people to look at them. They want people's attention. They want to fit in. Whereas somebody who is comfortable within themselves, they only speak when there is something important to say. And you find that people generally look upon such a person who only speaks when there is something important to say. They have what is known as haiba. Haiba in Arabic means that this person has this aura about them. This aura of you just have to respect that person. Because when they speak, they speak that which is productive and good and beneficial. And they don't joke around like clowns too much. You know when somebody's clowning around and joking around, t- telling jokes all of the time? Yeah, you can make people laugh, but the problem is people don't take you seriously. People won't take you seriously after that. People won't respect you. Whereas if you're a person that generally only speaks good and only speaks positive and productive things, then people will take you seriously and they will have haiba of you. So good speech is something we need to concentrate on and it's something which can bring us huge amounts of reward. In the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, he said, كُلُّ سَلَامَ مِنَ النَّاسِ عَلَيْهِ صَدَقَةٌ كُلُّ يَوْمٍ تَطْلَعُ فِيهِ شَمْس That every bone in the body or every joint in the body of a person, there is a charity that should be paid for that every day that the sun rises. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he went, he went on in the hadith, to mention certain types of charities like joining between two people who are arguing, bringing them back together. Like for example, helping somebody to get up on their riding beast and with their items lifting them up is a charity, okay? Until the Prophet ﷺ came to the point, which is what we want to concentrate on, where he said, And a good word is a charity. A good word is a charity. So you can imagine, right? Every time you speak a good word, you're getting the reward of having done a charity. So imagine now how we can leave people with a positive and happy beneficial experience rather than leaving them with a negative one. Because we can say good words with a smile, we can say encouraging words. When we choose words that we speak with, they shouldn't be harsh. They should be, you know, words of comfort, words of joy, words of fun, words of happiness, words of encouragement. Right, rather than the opposite, which many people sadly do, especially with our f- family members. Some people with their family members are extremely harsh, whereas when they're outside, mixing with people of the world, they're calm, collective, patient. But as soon as they come home, all that stress that they gathered from outside, they let it out on the family. And that's the complete opposite thing that we should be doing. Not saying that we should be harming people outside either, but rather with our family members, we should be extremely careful in how we speak to them. Right? It's difficult, it's not easy, but like the Prophet ﷺ said, that every time you speak a good word, you're getting charity. So instead of getting mad at your children all the time and telling them that you guys are thick, you never understand, you this, 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 always harassing your wife or your husband, whoever it may be that you're close to in your family, speak good words to them. Bring about a good ambience in the house by choosing to have good words. And of course, the best of words all of the time is that we have dhikr upon our tongues. So we have to force ourselves to speak good words, to choose and to think very carefully carefully and logically. What I'm about to say now, I have the choice, I have the freedom to choose the words I'm going to say. It's upon me to say good words and to change the atmosphere wherever I am into a positive atmosphere and to leave people after having this interaction with me 
leave them in a happy way in a beneficial way that they will in fact end up making dua for me that I made them happy due to the words that I said right so it's imperative that we always choose good words so we can get the reward of having charity now there are some clear misuses of the tongue that we're going to look into that we should uh, avoid right and this may even take another lecture but anyway some of them are as in follows in the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah where the Prophet وسلم, said as reported by Imam Tirmidhi إِنَّ مِنْ أَحَبِّكُمْ إِلَيَّ وَأَقَرَبِكُمْ مِنِّي مَجْلِسًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ That the verily, certainly on the day of judgment, those of you who will be the most beloved to me and the closest to me in sitting on the day of judgment, حَاسِنُكُمْ أَخْلَاقًا are the ones who have the best character. وَإِنَّ مِنْ أَبَغَضِكُمْ إِلَيَّ وَأَبْعَادِكُمْ مِنِّي مَجْلِسًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ And the opposite of that, those who be the most uh, the ones who anger me the most and the furthest, furthest, furthest from me in terms of proximity and sitting next to me in the Day of Judgment will be Atharfarun. Atharfarun. Atharfarun is a description which is given to people who talk too much. Right? So these people just, you just can't stop them talking. They'll talk about everything. They have opinion on every single matter. They don't realize that they need to check themselves about what they're saying. So the Prophet ﷺ is angered with this type of person that always talks non-stop, continually talking about everything, whether it's pertaining to that person or not pertaining to them, whether they have knowledge of that thing they're talking about or they don't have knowledge of the thing they're talking about, whether it's pleasing to Allah or not, they don't care, they just talk as much as they can. And also the Prophet ﷺ said, وَالْمُتَّشَدِّقُونَ And the mutashaddiqun, those who try to be unnaturally eloquent, and it was described as though they're like cows, you know, the tongue is just swishing around in the mouth. So people who try to be overly eloquent, which is in an unnatural way. If a person is academically gifted and they have that level of intelligence and they're able to speak in an eloquent manner naturally, then that's well and good. But to force it upon yourself and to know that it's not from who you are, and in fact you're doing it in a way of sh showing off, this is something which is despised to the Prophet ﷺ. And then he said, وَالْمُتَّفَيْهِقُونَ وَالْمُتَّفَيْهِقُونَ so the companions of the Allah Anhum, they said, we know the previous two, we know Atharfarun al wal mutashaddiqun But who are these new ones? We've never heard of this word before. Wal mutafayhiqun. The Prophet said they are the mutakabbirun, the ones who have arrogance in their speech and in their behavior. So what we have to avoid in this hadith is that we don't speak too much continually. We don't try to be over eloquent, yani in an unnatural way, like we're trying to show off to people, and nor do we have arrogance in our speech and in our behavior. And the next thing that we have to be extremely important, uh, extremely aware of and careful of not falling into with regards to manners of the tongue is regards to backbiting. So in the Quran and Sunnah, the Quran and Sunnah is replete. Everywhere we find in the Quran and Sunnah warnings after warnings of not to fall into backbiting and slander and such things and mentioning the grave consequences of the ones who fall into such things, right? Because shaitan, he wants us to just dig into the honor of other Muslims and other people this is what he wants us to do and on social media and in the various platforms we have now people are writing away talking about other people and they don't realize that actually writing is like speech you're going to be taken to account for it so the Muslims they have to know that backbiting and slandering and speaking bad of people without legitimate uh, reason there are some legitimate reasons without legitimate reason or legitimate cause without permission from the Sharia which is so enmity and hatred amongst people in the community and it's something which needs to be avoided and it's something that which shaitan always wants us to do in fact shaitan comes to us and beautifies this deed of backbiting to us how in the hadith in sahih muslim the prophet sallallahu said atadruna mal ghiba do you people know what backbiting is they said allah wa rasuluhu a'lam they said allah and his messenger know best qal al ghiba tu dhikruka akhaka bima yakrahu Ghiba, backbiting, is to mention about your brother or sister that which they dislike to be mentioned. Faqil, so one of them they said, right, they thought they were being clever maybe, and many people say this in fact today. They said, Ara'ayta ya Rasulullah in kana fi akhima akul. They said, Oh Messenger of Allah, but what if it's the situation that what I'm saying about this person is true? You know, many times we've tried to stop people backbiting about a particular person. And they say, but bro, sister, it's true. What I'm saying is, I'm not making it up, it's true. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِن كَانَ فِيهِ مَا تَقُولْ فَقَدْ اخْتَبْتَهُ If it is, in fact, that what you are mentioning about the person is true, then that is the reality of backbiting. وَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ فِيهِ مَا تَقُولْ فَقَدْ اخْتَبْتَهُ فَقَدْ بَهَتَّهُ 
And if it's not in this person what you are saying about them, then you have slandered this person. It's not only backbiting now, it's slandering because it's not true. So backbiting is that you mention about people something which is true about them, but which they dislike that, that they dislike that it be mentioned, right? We need to avoid that. And we can't say, oh, well, but it's true. You know, the person really does behave like that. And the person really does do that. No, that has to be avoided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Hujurat, He mentioned that it's like eating the dead flesh of a dead person. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu stanibu kathira min al-dhanni inna ba'da al-dhanni ithm aw yuhu believe avoid much suspicion because most of suspicion suspicion is a sin. Wa la tajassasu wa la yakhtab ba'dukum ba'da and don't spy on one another and don't backbite one another. Would you like one of you that you eat the dead flesh of your brother or sister? Yani the dead corpse is in front of you and you're sitting there with your knife and fork digging into that flesh and eating it. This is what backbiting is. Allah likens the act of backbiting to eating the flesh of a dead corpse. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَوَابُ الرَّحِيمِ Have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who is oft forgiving and merciful. So we have to be extremely careful not to fall into backbiting. It's a despicable deed in the sight of the Quran and Sunnah. Some people, they make it their mission that they want to find faults of other people so they could spread the faults of other people. Doing this is extremely dangerous. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Sahih al-Jami'ah, يَا مَعْشَرَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِلِسَانِهِ وَلَمْ يَدْخُلُ الْإِيمَانُ قَلْبَهُ Oh, you group of people that have believed only with your tongues, and faith, Iman, hasn't yet entered into your heart. لا تغتابوا المسلمين لا تغتابوا المسلمين Don't backbite the believers. ولا تتبعوا أوراتهم And don't follow up their mistakes. Don't be looking for their mistakes. فإنه من يتبع أورات المسلمين تتبع الله أوراته For verily, that person who follows up the mistakes of the believers, looking for them all the time, noting them and then spreading them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will follow up the mistakes of that person. وَمَنْ تَتَبَّعَ أَوْرَاتَهُ يُفْدِحُهُ وَلَوْ فِي جَوْ فِي بَيْتِهِ And whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala follows up the mistakes of an individual, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose that person even if they are hidden away in their houses, in the depths of their houses. So as a reward for people who are always following up mistakes of other people and spreading them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to one day expose you also. May Allah protect us. So never be a person that is always looking for the mistakes of the believers, right? Rather, you should cover the faults of the believers if you are able to do so. So one should always fear that, okay, I'm looking at somebody who's got mistakes. There's two things that should run through my mind. Number one, that person has mistakes, but they may have huge amounts of hidden good deeds that I don't know about. They may soon repent from these mistakes and become a better person than I am. And that's what we should make dua for them. That when we see mistakes in a person, we, we make dua that they repent from those mistakes and become better than they are now in a particular situation. And also we have to remember that we can only mention the mistakes of a person if there is a valid Sharia reason to do so, which we will come to know in a while. But the most important thing is to remember when we see mistakes in other people, we should think about our mistakes more so. That, okay, that person has that mistake, but I'm yani, more having that mistake or other mistakes similar to it. And that person may have hidden good deeds, as we said. Tayyip. So with regards to backbiting, we know it's a sinful thing. We know it's something which is horrible and we have to stay away from. But there are generally some times wherein people can backbite, but it wouldn't be considered as backbiting in these occasions. But they're very... Um, in the sense that we can't take them easy. We have to be very careful before we embark upon getting ourselves into one of these situations. Anyway, number one, when the ulama say it's permissible to, to backbite is if some transgression and oppression is taking place to you. So then you can go to the people of authority, to the judge, for example, and you can complain about your neighbor, that my neighbor is doing X, Y, and Z to me. Okay, in this situation, you are allowed to explain what the neighbor or the person who is harming you, oppressing you, is doing to you. So this, you're mentioning, of course, that which they don't want you to do, uh, don't want you to mention about them, but you're mentioning it for a legitimate reason, which is that you need this oppression and transgression removed from yourself. So you take it to a relevant person. You don't take it to a weak individual who can't do anything about it. You take it to the authorities, to the judge, 
who can ensure that something is done about it, right? If you took it to just some other person who has no authority, then that's just plain backbiting. Another reason is to seek help in removing some evil, right? You see some evil taking place in the community and you want it to be removed. For example, you find that somebody in the Muslim community is selling alcohol. So then you can go to the authorities and mention to the authorities that Ahmed down the road, who's got the corner store, he's selling alcohol. So though you're backbiting, here it's a legitimate reason because you're asking and you're seeking help for this evil to be removed, okay? You're asking them to go and intervene. Also, a one which is common, is that you can mention the faults of a person in order to get an Islamic ruling pertaining to a particular person or to a particular situation. So when the wife is being abused, may Allah protect our sisters, there's too much abuse taking place and even brothers are being abused in this day and age by their uh, women folk, very crazy situations. Um, so when the spouse, either one of them goes and complains about what their partner is doing, how their partner is behaving and what they're saying and the oppression that they're committing, then this is something which is allowed. However, when you go to a scholar uh, who can guide you to how to solve the problem. However, it's better if possible that you mention that what is the situation, O oh Sheikh, that I do in such a such situation, if this is happening to me. Or you can mention that, that it's happening to my friend, that such and such is happening. So you don't have to make it personal. If you can do it in such a way without making it personal, that may be better. Okay? Now. And also, another reason why people are allowed to um, fall into a type of backbiting is when to warn about the evil of other Muslims. Say, for example, the Hadith scholars, what they used to do in the past, and this is done and dusted, really, and truly, so people don't need to revive this. What they would do is about the narrators of Hadith, if it was known that this narrator of a Hadith had a bad memory or they had some evil trait in them, they would note this down in the biographies of the narrators of Hadith. So then the people who came later would know not to take hadith from this particular person or if this person is found in the chain of narration of the hadith then the hadith is weakened right but what some people do today they misuse this and they if there's, the, if there's a particular scholar that they don't like they say we're doing jahr uh, jahr wa ta'deel which is uh, criticizing narrators right but this as we said as i mentioned is only for the books of hadith it's been done it's finished right so it shouldn't be done now allah knows best um, also, it could be that you want the Muslims might want to advise against a particular person who openly spreads their evil, right? Openly spreads their evil in society. So this person can be warned against that such and such, you know, don't take your knowledge from that person. That person is openly spreading evil and openly spreading statements which are contrary to, to Islam, etc, etc. And also another situation pertaining to this category to warn uh, and advise Muslims about evil. Say, for example, somebody comes to take your daughter or your son's hand in marriage and then somebody comes to you to advise you that actually I know this person very well and this person that's asking for your daughter's hand in marriage, I know about them X, Y and Z. So this person is allowed to tell you that X, Y and Z is true about this person, that there's something you need to watch out for. They, they, they beat their women, uh, they, they cheat people, they, they rob people's money, for example. These horrible things can be mentioned to you. Right, but the person shouldn't go above and beyond what is pertaining to the matter at hand, which is letting you know what the things which could affect the marriage. And then also, um, babe, that's it really. Uh, the other ones are a bit more technical. So in general, what we've said is that we have to avoid backbiting. We have to avoid misusing our tongue, and we have to avoid using the tongue in a way which would bring us about bring about for us. Uh, lots of sin and lots of things that we will regret. You know the tongue often we say something with the tongue and then we soon fall into regret Why did I say that? I didn't have to say that So if we choose to be those who are cognizant of what we're saying and train ourselves to say good words and train ourselves to take a deep breath before getting angry and and Think carefully about what we want to say then we can really change the way that we gain reward and we can ensure that we stay away from those evil acts that we shouldn't fall into inshallah there will be a part two in the next session and we will talk about other things which the tongue uh, could fall into and that we have to be aware to stay away from. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if there was anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mistake com mistakes and shortcomings were from myself and shaitan. If you have any questions then feel free.